Welcome to the Wood Turning Workshop. Today is the last episode on how to turn a bowl. Last week we worked with green wood and prepared it for drying. Well this week we're going to take a dried blank and turn it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Also we have a special treat for you today. We have highlights from the American Association of Wood Turners 2005 Annual Symposium. It's an inspiring, educational and fun event. Stay tuned for this episode of the Wood Turning Workshop. of this size can take up to six months to dry and the one we turned last week isn't dry yet so I borrowed this one from a friend and some of you might be looking at this and saying wow that has a lot of character well that character is actually gonna be the highlight of the piece it'll really be beautiful when we're done the first thing we want to do is to mount this on the lathe and return the tenon I've got my chuck on here with the jaw spread out we'll take this push it against the jaws bring the tail stock up tighten it now that's holding it firmly so we can return the tenon. I want to start by flattening the bottom of the tenon. A pull cut with a bowl gouge does this nicely. And you might notice that I'm running the lathe at a fairly slow speed. This is because the blank is out of balance. Running the lathe any faster would create vibration that could cause several problems, the worst of which would result in the workpiece flying off the lathe. Use a push cut to shape the side of the tenon. Go back to the pull cut to make a flat shoulder. Finish with a skew chisel to ensure that the shoulder and tenon are perfectly flat. Look at how out around this blank is. There's a lot of distortion when wood dries. Well, while we have access to this end, this is where we're going to start cutting to start rounding the blank out. We're going to start with a bowl gouge and take small cuts. We want to take a little bit of wood at a time and work our way back in sections. I'm using a push cut, and you can see that it leaves a lot of small ridges. This is because the tailstock is in the way of the tool handle, and it prevents me from rubbing the bevel. Since I'm just roughing out the blank, I'm not worried about a perfect surface yet, and I'll clean this up later. Now look how the ridges have disappeared. This is because I've cut far enough around the bowl that the tool handle no longer hits the tailstock, and the bevel can contact the wood. When a blank is this out of round, it's hard to see the surface of the wood, and that makes it difficult to gauge how deep or aggressive a cut you are making. If you look up occasionally, it's easier to see the profile of the bowl and how your cut is affecting it. As I go further up the blank, the surface is more out of round, and the tool really wants to bounce. That's why it's even more important to work in small increments. If I took long, deep cuts, I would probably lose control of the gouge and get an impressive catch. Remember that character in the wood? 
Well, it sometimes has a tendency to fly off, so every now and then stop the lathe and pull out any loose pieces you find. Now we're ready to refine the shape of the bowl. I'm going to first establish the foot. I want it to be about one-third the diameter of the bowl. You can see that I've also been able to speed up the lathe because the blank is better balanced now. To make the transition from the foot to the side, I'm using a pull cut. If I try to push cut, I'd run into the same problem I had earlier, where the tool handle would hit the tailstock, and I wouldn't be able to rub the bevel, and that would leave ridges. Now I can switch to a push cut to clean up the rest of the bowl surface. I've got the bowl shape the way I want it. I'm going to remove the tailstock, reverse the bowl, and put it in the chuck. Tighten the chuck jaws down. And I'm going to make one final cut on the outside to clean it up before I sand. And that final cut is going to be a shearing cut, and I'll use the bowl gouge to do that. To make the shearing cut, take your bowl gouge, raise the tip up at an angle, and then slowly bring the bevel in contact with the wood and pull with the grain for supported cut. It'll take off fine ribbons of wood and leave you a beautiful surface. Now we want to shape the rim. I'm going to make a flat rim that dips inward so it'll draw your eye towards the character in the wood. I'm going to take my bowl gouge to make the cut. Because the rim is so warm from drying, there is really no up or downhill direction to the grain yet. So I'm not worried about leaving a perfect surface. I just want to get the rim flat so I can start shaping it. With the rim flattened, I can now start to shape it. By cutting towards the center of the bowl, I will leave a smooth surface without any grain tear out. I'm using a drill to sand the outside of the bowl for a couple of reasons. First, it's too dangerous to hand sand a surface that has holes in it. Secondly, using a drill to power sand is much faster. This is also a great chance to make subtle shape changes. I'm using a sanding mandrel with a firm foam pad, and that allows me to apply light pressure to gently refine the shape of the bowl. As with all sanding, keep moving to minimize heat buildup and don't skip any grits. I'm starting with 80 grit and will work my way through 320. Now that we have the outside of the bowl sanded and the rim, we're going to start turning away the inside of the bowl and finish it up. We're going to just take small, light cuts, work our way in about an inch at a time and come to our final wall thickness before we move any deeper. I'm now using a curved tool rest so I won't have so much overhang with the bowl gouge as I'm working. And I'm also switching to a heavier bowl gouge. That will reduce some of the vibration and make the cuts go easier. You can see how out around the bowl is on the inside. So you're going to be cutting air for a little while, so just take it slow and carefully. Take very light cuts and make sure that the bevel of your tool is aiming the direction you want to go. That way the tool won't skate back across the rim that you spent so much time sanding. Also, I want to work on the inside of the bowl about one inch at a time. It's just like turning a green bowl. I want to work my way in slowly. 
I want to finish the piece I just worked on, move to the next section until I get to the bottom of the bowl. When you're done with the first section, move further into the bowl and start shaping the next section. Here you can see what I mean about pointing the bevel in the direction of the cut. I'm pushing the bowl gouge towards the foot of the bowl, and at the same time I'm applying light pressure towards the outside of the bowl. That outward pressure keeps the bevel of the gouge in contact with the wood and provides a stable surface to guide and steady the cut. I've got two passes done. This would be the time I'd normally take my calipers out and start measuring the wall to make sure I keep the thickness the same way all the way through. But since I have this great void in the wood, I'm just going to eye it in from here. But because of this void, I want to make sure that I have the bowl completely finished from this point on. I don't want to have to come back and work on it later because there wouldn't be enough structure to it. It'd vibrate too much. And the way I'm going to clean this up is with a scraper. Now normally you wouldn't want to use the scraper on the bowl rim because it's too grabby but we've put a grind on the top, and that's what's called a negative rake by some people. It makes it a really tame tool at that point, and you can take beautiful cuts without any grabbing. With a negative rake, you present the tool in a flat manner. Incredibly, this tool is very tame, and it's almost impossible to get a catch. The only drawback to this grind is that the tool cannot remove wood as quickly as a conventional grind. But hey, we're scraping after all. We're not in a race. We're after a smooth surface. A scraper dulls quickly and requires many trips to the grinder. One way to lengthen the time between sharpenings is to use as much of the scraper's edge as possible. You're only using a small portion of the scraping edge at a time. So by slightly pivoting the scraper, you have a fresh edge of the tool to work with. With the first section finished, grab your bowl gouge and start shaping the next section. Now is the time I must be even more careful about taking light cuts because we're starting to cut through that character we talked about earlier. And that character consists of air and knot holes. Knot holes are a very tough and dense concentration of end grain fibers surrounded by softer side grain. If I take an aggressive cut, the bowl gouge will hit the knot holes, bounce off the wood, and then dig in on coming back in contact with the side grain. I'll end up with an uneven surface and torn fibers. To make sure that I take controlled light cuts, I must pay attention to my body mechanics. Remember to move the tool and your body as one unit. It's the arc that you make with your body that directs the gouge around the curve of the bowl. So stand with your feet apart and shift your weight to make the cut. Go back to your scraper to smooth the surface. Work your way from the bottom of the bowl towards the rim. Take your time and blend this section with the first section. It's important to remove all ridges and torn grain now because they'll be very difficult to remove with sandpaper later. And as with the bowl gouge, move your body and the tool together to create the smoothest surface possible.
we're ready to sand again. Just like the outside, we're going to work our way through 320 grit. Then we're going to reverse the bowl and work on the foot. Remember to slow your speed on your lathe down. When power sanding the inside of a bowl, present the drill at an angle so the trailing edge of the sanding pad makes contact with the wood. If you use the top of the pad to sand, the rotation of the bowl will grab the pad and throw the drill downward. We've got the bowl reversed now, just like we did in the beginning with the tailstock pressing the bowl into the jaws. The only difference is I put a piece of chamois in between the jaws and the bowl so it wouldn't scratch the inside. Now we're going to use our bowl gouge to form the bottom. I'm going to start by reducing the tenon. I'm using the same push cut that I used earlier to shape it. Leave about an inch of the tenon to support the live center. With most of the tendon removed, I can shape the bottom of the bull's foot. The push cut removes the excess wood. The pull cut cleans up the surface. And I'm cutting a little bit deeper each time to leave the bottom slightly concave. Soon, all I have left is this nub of wood. Carefully reduce the diameter, but don't make it too small or it could snap and your bowl will fly off the leg. This small bit of wood that is left will be knocked off with a chisel. Since we're now working with side grain, any tool marks can easily be removed by sanding. I'm applying an oil finish. Look how nice the grain comes out. I think this is a really good complement to the natural look of this bowl. I've let the oil soak in for about five minutes, and I'm using a dry cloth to buff off any excess. And the final step, to protect the finish, I'll put a wax coating on. I hope you've enjoyed these last three episodes where we've gone from tree to finished bowl. It's been a lot of fun. And as I promised at the beginning of the show, we visited the AAW 2005 Symposium. The AAW is the American Association of Woodturners. The AAW is a nonprofit organization whose goal is to provide education, information, and organization to those interested in woodturning. Currently, they have over 11,000 members and 250 chapter clubs. All 50 states are represented with several more clubs outside the U.S. That's one way to do it or you could also use scrapers. The highlight of the organization's year is their annual symposium. It provides wood turners with a variety of educational and informational opportunities. The 2005 symposium presented demonstrations by the superstars of wood turning, lectures on such diverse issues as plagiarism and education, special hands-on youth turning workshops, an auction raising money for educational opportunity grants, an invitational gallery, and an incredible instant gallery showcasing the attendees' turnings. We caught up with AEW President Phil Brynion during our visit. Our uh, job, as we see it, is to promote and educate people about wood turning. Um, there's many diverse areas of wood turning, and wood turning is something that uh, can certainly enrich people's lives if they know something about it. How do you do that? This simple question drew over 1,100 people to the 2005 symposium, the largest crowd ever. For three days, several conference rooms were filled with turners eager to learn the newest techniques from some of the best. The demonstrations were set up in rotation, so if you missed one, you could catch it at a later time. 38 wood turners representing six countries provided the attendees with 158 rotations. One way I found to sort of minimize that, if you dilute it a little bit, Demonstrations were enhanced by several video cameras and televisions for better viewing. And while every demonstration was professionally presented, they still had a personal feel to them. 
the AAW is more of a family than an organization. And when you're part of a family, you know you can get right up close to people. Bonnie Klein, assisted by 50 volunteers, headed up a groundbreaking event. For two days, a room full of lays and turning equipment was dedicated to the first ever youth workshop at the symposium. Children of all ages learned the basics of wood turning from volunteers. With each session filled to capacity, the workshop turned out to be an overwhelming success. To me, this is a historical moment for the AEW. This is the first time we've done this with 20 lays and 20 hands-on experiences for the kids. And I hope it's a trend that continues. I hope these kids, 20 years, 40 years, are still wood turners and will remember this moment. This is, this is a fantastic, exciting moment, and I love seeing it. I love being a part of it. All of the equipment for the youth workshop was donated by various manufacturers. Later, a drawing was held, and the 20 lays with their tools and accessories were given to the children who had participated in the workshops. Every year, the symposium has an invitational gallery exhibit with a special theme. Since this year's location was Kansas, the theme was an obvious choice. Return to the Land of Oz was a springboard for Turners to let their imaginations run wild. Judging by the quality of work, it was a resounding success. I don't think there's anybody out there that doesn't relate to um, Oz in uh, you know, the, the wonderful uh, classic novel. What new toy do I need? With any gathering of wood turners, this thought will sooner or later enter their mind. Fortunately, this symposium provides one of the largest gathering of wood turning suppliers in the world. If anyone walked out without a new tool, gadget, or exotic piece of wood, they were a much stronger person than I was. But seriously, this hands-on access to so much equipment is a rare opportunity to evaluate various versions of a tool or lathe before you part with your hard-earned dollars. But enough about tools, let's talk about wood. The amount and variety of wood displayed there was impressive. There were species of wood from all over the world. Even if you didn't buy anything, at least you broaden your horizons by learning about new and exotic turning materials. Wood turning is not just a physical craft. It challenges your imagination, questions your approach to problems, and even tests your ethics. That is why the AAW provides special lectures to discuss and confront these issues. A case in point was a roundtable discussion about copying and plagiarism. Many turners struggle trying to figure out where does one's work cross the line of inspiration to imitation. David Ellsworth. Turners don't have a lot of time in many cases to work on the lathe. You have a lot of people in the, who, are, who are not retired, believe it or not, who actually have jobs and a couple of hours on the weekend. And when they go to the lathe, they want to get something done. Their inspirations, obviously, can in many cases come from what they see in magazine articles and et cetera. And this is wonderful because that's how we pass ideas and concepts from generation to generation. If we can find ways to discover more about ourselves, then we combine that with the technical aspect. And then the idea of, of copying is not such a difficulty any longer. Every symposium, turners donate items to be sold through an auction. The AAW uses these funds to pay for educational opportunity grants. The grants help individuals and clubs cover expenses such as teaching equipment, demonstrator fees, and tuition. The auction was lively, entertaining, and well attended. Turners and collectors had the opportunity to bid on a multitude of incredible items. The auction raised a record $68,000. It's nearly impossible to cover everything at the 2005 AAW Symposium, but we cannot leave without talking about the Instant Gallery, one of the most unique aspects of the event. Every turner was encouraged to bring examples of their work. These items are placed on display in a large exhibit hall for everyone to see. The variety, quality, and quantity of the work was incredible. It's inspiring to see so much diversity in one place.
If you'd like some more information about the American Association of Woodturners, you can go to www.woodturner.org. They have a lot of great free resources on their site for the beginning and experienced turner. Well, until the next time on the Wood Turning Workshop, keep turning. Purchase this episode of Wood Turning Workshop. Send check or money order for 1995 made payable to KRSC TV. Indicate DVD or VHS. Include episode number. This week on the Wood Turning Workshop, the last part of our three part series on how to turn a bolt. I'm going to make a flat rim that dips inward so it'll draw your eye towards the character in the wood. I hope you've enjoyed these last three episodes where we've gone from tree to finished bowl. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs>